Thanks, Jay. All right. Give it up for Jay. Give it up for Jay, everybody. <sighs> Jay. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. And if there are any technical problems during the course of the presentation, I'm the only one here who doesn't work at Google. It's my fault. Okay. Anything that goes wrong, it's all on me. Just know that right from the stop start. Um, I just want to take a second and just let's just look at this young lady for just a second. Um, now, we're incredibly good as human beings at just glancing at somebody else and getting a vibe of who they are. You know, you just look at, somebody gets in the elevator, and in about 15 seconds, you wind up making some sort of judgment that if you were to talk to them for an hour, 80% of the time, you actually have a pretty good sense, just from body language and stuff. And this woman could have been a, you know, depending on how the birth lottery works out, could have been a grad student, you know, somewhere here, or maybe she's the lady who takes your blood in the hospital, or she's the doctor, or who knows, she could be anything. Unfortunately, um, this is in Cambodia. She's uh, that, standing in front of her home uh, near Sim Reap. Uh, that corrugated tin is her home. And she, has, uh, she works insane hours. I, I doubt, and I know people at Google work really hard hours. I doubt there's anyone in here who works longer hours than she does. Um, at the time I met her, uh, she's 29 years old, uh, married to a guy the same age. Between the two of them, they have four jobs. She, works, uh, she has a roadside kiosk. Uh, where she sells gum and sundries and so on to passers-by uh, for about six hours in the morning, and then she goes in and works a full-time job as one of the people in the tourist hotels, the fancy ones near Sim Reap, where uh, uh, tourists come and you know go and take the big tour of the Angkor Wat. And uh, the, uh, the little kiosk that she has is funded with microloans. And she makes a, a small but regular profit at this kiosk. And with that and some, you know, her husband's jobs and so on, they're trying to you know, build a life. Um, she's not getting rich doing this, but it's helping her build her life. It's really cool. And uh, I was honored to, when I met her, she opens the doors, hey, come on in, super cool, sat down on the, the, uh, the, the car seat, the front car seat that's the couch on the porch, and we hung out and had a, a, a wonderful day. And this was actually very typical of a lot of the people I met. Now, I want to back up a little bit and give you a, just a, a quick thumbnail of how I came to this. I want to make really clear, I don't work for Kiva, I don't speak for Kiva, they're just a charity I really like that I've written a book about and when I first came in the front door, I really didn't know, does this work, is this great, is it wonderful, is it, what, what am I getting into? Um, and I've, I've, I've found a lot of good stuff here, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about myself too. The main thing that I, I have had an insanely lucky life. I, I won every lottery there is, I, I think. I, I grew up middle class, um, don't get me wrong, but I've gotten to do stuff like that, and I, was, I wrote for CSI and for Bones, and I've done TV, and I've made, made aquatic friends, and uh, I've had uh, I've just a wonderful opportunity to go out and see the world. I've kissed the Blarney Stone um, a couple times, actually, and I got on real well. Um, I've rocked the actual Casbah, um, which is, uh, it turns out, a really great place to play beach soccer, which is neat. The countries in red are the ones that I've had the opportunity to visit. Um, as you can see, I suck at Africa. Uh, I, I need to, to catch up there. Uh, Central Asia is a, is a definite weakness. But I've had the opportunity to see the world. I was a travel writer for a while. And as you travel enough, I mean, on the, on the surface, there's like all these different cultures and languages and, and customs and so on. But eventually, and, and maybe it's just user fatigue from the world or something, but for me, as I watch people playing their music and hanging out, it just turns into this beautiful pageant of, of people where Stuff that looks different on the surface all starts feeling like a coat of paint you could scratch off with a fingernail. I mean, the truth is everybody's just trying to put food on the table. Everybody's just trying to, you know, take care of their kids. I mean, we're in Santiago, Chile in this photo here. And these are goth kids in Santiago, Chile, who are demonstrating how different they are from everyone else by dressing exactly like goth kids in every other part of the world. That's kind of wonderful, isn't it? Uh, so. I don't know what those guys were doing. Uh, and we blow on our blowers and we, we, you know, ride around on our giant contraptions and we dance and we play and we beat each other up. And it just turns into this, just, I don't know, festival as I was traveling. I just wound up making friends like every single place I ever went over and over and over and over, including places that I just didn't think I'd necessarily be welcomed. That's, uh, this is Egypt in 2004 as the United States was invading Iraq and the Middle East was supposed to be very, very dangerous um, and you know, there's anti-American sentiment and I got gang befriended just walking around the streets of Alexandria. People would find out I was an American and they didn't blame me for what the American government was doing because Egyptians have some experience with the government not doing what they want it to do. 
Um, so they didn't blame me personally, and I was just gang befriended everywhere I went. Um, and put microfinance aside, okay? No matter what we might talk about with Kiva or whatever, if like you have to leave, if there's any takeaway that I would want people to have from this, it's that if you walk in with an open heart, you would have been befriended exactly the same way too. It's a cool planet. Yeah, there's a couple of dozen dangerous places that I wouldn't want to go to, but just a couple of dozen. And at the end of the day, you know, we knock off from our job, we put our arm around somebody we love, we take good care of our children, you know, and, and, um, and we go home. But that view of the world is not one that's very common in America. Uh, this, by the way, this, this, by the, this is in Australia. These are actual paid cricket seats at a cricket match. Um, not the best seats I've ever been in. Uh, there's a thing, that, that big wall, um, it's a sight screen. It's, it, it rolls back and forth. It's so that the batter on the other side of the wall has a, a clear background as the, pitch, as the, as the bowler delivers the ball. Um, and they'll roll it right in front of you. If the, batter, if the batsman needs it there, it's there, and suddenly you can't see. And for me, this is very much a metaphor for watching American news when it broadcasts about, when it's talking about international affairs. Uh, you really can't see much if you're watching American news because the rest of the world, you know, is blowing up. It's on fire. There's bad things happening. People are oppressing each other in the streets, and that's kind of all you see. You don't see all that wonderful stuff I just showed you, in which you, your own experience, I'm sure as you travel, you have the same, uh, a, a very similar experience. This is what we get in the media, you know, is fresh wave of terror feared, which is an actual headline in Belfast. Um, and I have to tell you, how do you not fear a wave of terror? It's a wave of terror. <laughs> You'll fear it. I mean, it's kind of hardwired. And by the way, does Belfast and Northern Ireland really need alarmism in the media? Is that helping? Do they really need that? So anyway, in the course of all of this crazy luck that I've had, um, in 2008, I lucked out some more. And I, I wandered into a job writing, uh, a, doing luxury travel. I worked for Forbes Traveler, writing uh, reviews of the finest accommodations on Earth. Now, again, let me back up. I'm middle class. My dad worked for General Motors for 37 years, came home exhausted at the end of the day. My mom worked in a five and dime. My grandfather was a coal miner. I can go full Loretta Lynn on you if you need, okay? And suddenly, I'm jetting around the world, going to the south of France, the English countryside, and I'm eating things I can't pronounce. And it's my job to walk in with the white glove, you know? And, um, and I, I kept waiting every second for some waiter to just, no, sir, you are not part of this. And, uh, and it was fun. It was super fun. So my byline winds up on things like 50 Europe, Europe's 50 best hotels. You know, I didn't even have to choose the hotels. They'd already done it for me. I just had to show up and verify that the beds were comfy. And I'd write a little piece saying, yep, beds don't suck. That was my job. I got paid to take the trip of a lifetime that people would want. I went all over the world doing that. That's pretty cool. And, but the thing is, it gets, it gets really boring because wealth without purpose is purposeless, kind of built in. And I, I was bored out of my mind, surprisingly. It took a few weeks. Don't get me wrong. It took a little while. <laughs> but after a while, you could, it's completely purposeless. And, and I was just losing my mind with the boredom. I was seeing beautiful things. I mean, oh, I don't know how that got in there. Um, this is another one of those articles. Uh, the, you know, Italy's 25 best hotels. It looks so much like the other article. You'd be bored just even reading what I was writing. I was bored writing it. How many synonyms for comfortable are there, really, in the English language? There's just not much you can do. Um, so I'm traveling around. I'm seeing all this stuff. And finally, I'm in, in the Emirates. And the United Arab Emirates, as you know, have a little money. And uh, this is the Emirates Palace in Dubai, which at the time was the most expensive hotel in the world. Three billion dollar luxury accommodation. And I should tell you, that is not the Emirates Palace. That office building size thing, that's the entrance gate to the Emirates Palace. I'm standing on the steps of the Emirates Palace looking out at the entrance gate. It's actually best viewed by one of your products, Google Earth. Uh, the triumphalist entrance gate, that's, that's this little bitty building right here. That's the Emirates Palace, which actually has as much floor space as the Pentagon. Uh, you know, there's a kilometer of private beach, and they have, it's, it, was, it was insane. Um, and you know, this is where heads of state come and, and stay, and, and by the way, the beds are comfy. It was a fantastic time. Now, you can live in this kind of wealth and feel fairly stable and guilt-free and so on in the south of France. You don't have poverty right in your face. You know, you don't see the rich and poor. But in the Emirates, it's right there. Just a couple days later, I'm in Dubai. And, you know, who's building these places? A 
essentially indentured servants. It's you know people from South Asia, people there's some Southeast Asians, East Africans, and they're getting paid at the time, depending on whose reports you're believing at the time, six bucks a day, seven bucks, whatever, to work 12-hour days in 105, 110 degree heat, and then they're shuttled off back to camps in the desert that aren't even on any tourist uh, uh, map or whatever. They're just totally hidden away. And they're the ones building all these magical, wonderful paradises that they'll never see the insides of. And, you know, my dad worked his butt off. And I'm, Cleveland, where I'm from, doesn't get as hot as the Emirates. But, you know, if the guy'd worked two shifts and, you know, 12-hour day and, and it was, uh, you know, 90 and humid and he's sitting on, the, on the, the front steps of our house when I'm 12 years old and it's a hot August and he's sitting there with a beer in his hand just trying to rally himself for another goddamn day of this. I remember just, you're a kid, you know, and you can just remember being around it and how painful that was. And I looked at these guys and... I don't know why it hit me here of all places, but it did. I couldn't not see my dad. And then I find out that the reason they take these gigs, and they gotta go and stay for years at a time on their contracts, is because they can send of that six bucks a day, maybe three bucks a day home to Nepal or to India or wherever they're from and help take care of their kids. They're in this hell because they love their families. How am I going to take this money that I'm getting paid by Forbes and just put it in my pocket and fly home and go, well, that was spiffy. How could I do that? I've got to do something with it, right? So this is where I kind of decided that I needed to, you know, and I'm seeing the world, and, you know, there's parts of the world where that's a real modern thing you'll see. You know, it's like a trip back in time in some parts of the world. And I was seeing kids like that in India, and I just, you know, changed priorities ahead. That's a real sign, by the way. That's, um, that's a Gatwick Airport on the way out of the rental car counter. And, uh, and sure enough, the guy in that black car up there pulled over and started spending more time with his family. So it's a <laughs> real sign. Um, and I passed through that sign, and I needed to do something. And I, Muhammad Yunus had won the Nobel Peace Prize. That got my attention. And I'm thinking about these guys and thinking about these guys. And I came across Kiva. <coughs> Kiva, as you know, its web platform allows people to uh, uh, support micro-lending by uh, putting money in uh, that supports the loans that have gone out to people in the field, small entrepreneurs. But does it actually work? Does the money actually get there? Does it actually make any difference? That's a big question. That matters. Um, and there's been some controversy about that. There's been some questions about that. Okay, well, I'm a writer. I need a job. What can I do? I went out to go look. I wrote a book. Um, let's, let's go out and go meet some clients. Let's meet some clients, shall we? Um, our first contestant. This is a lovely woman, uh, uh, Zorka Jokic. Um, now, by the way, meeting the clients, if you're a Kiva lender, is not easy. This is not, the, you know, MFIs are not travel agencies, microfinance institutions. This took time. I had to, uh, and the book goes into all of it. I, I um, basically, Kiva didn't know what the heck of make of me when I showed up at first. They were, you know, they get people all the time saying, hey, I'd like to go visit my clients. And they're like, yeah, you and, uh, you know, a million other people. Um, but I just kind of stuck with it, and I had a lot of travel experience, and, and I'm persistent. And so I, I uh, uh, a little bit of the backstory here. Um, the MFI, the, the Kiva partner in Bosnia and Herzegovina at the time, uh, was a, a branch of an international women's organization called Women for Women International that do amazing work in some of the most difficult environments in the world. They're, they're in Afghanistan and Rwanda and Bosnia, and I mean, you name it. You look at their website, Women for Women, these people rock, right? And so in Bosnia, after the war, and without getting into anything grim, but if you know like what happened during the Bosnian War, some of the incredibly violent, horrible things that were done to women during that war, um, the women of Bosnia need, you know, there's, there's training and education and, and logistic, like personal support. Some of these women don't even have counseling, and, and just going to a Women for Women meetings is the first opportunity they've had to sit in a room together and cry or talk, or be hugged. I mean, they do amazing stuff, and microfinance is just one aspect of what women for women do. So I'm sitting in the office in Sarajevo uh, with this wonderful woman, Saida, who runs Women for Women, and I, we're talking about this whole project, and I mentioned, and I, at this point I'm kind of thinking, I'm, I probably, I don't know if I'll ever even meet any clients, and, and I mentioned that, you know, I, I, I've made some loans through Kiva to some of the clients, and she goes, oh, you have names? And she's just going to hook me right up. And I'm like, well, yeah, I can tell you who I lent to. Sure, I hear. The next day, I'm in a car. I drive up to Twisla. Um, unlike Hillary Clinton, I didn't make a corkscrew landing. I drove to Twisla. And, uh, and, and next thing you know, I'm sitting on Zorka's front porch. And she reminds me a heck of a lot like my, uh, of my own mother, to tell you the truth. Um, 
And as you can see, she's in the, uh, the pig business. Um, she buys them and, and finances the, uh, the large expenditure with microloans, then brings them back, cuts them up, sells them. She also has poultry and does some other stuff. And uh, uh, so we're sitting on her porch, and we're having coffee, and we're hanging out. And in the course of the, uh, I'll show you, you know, this is me with her. Um, she was smiling the whole time from when we took, took, took out the camera, and this was really common. People's teeth aren't very good in a lot of parts of the world, so when you whip out a camera, they kind of close up the mouth a little bit. But she was a total sweetheart, I promise you. Um, and she's bugging me to call my mom. You know, when was the last time you spoke to your own mom? And, uh, and I get out the phone, I call my mom. You know, yeah, mom, hi, I'm in Bosnia. Yeah, Bosnia, yeah, look it up. Yeah, anyway. So uh, we're sitting there on the porch, and we are a short drive from where, in the living memory of everyone on that porch, massacres had taken place between Croats, Catholic Croats, and the Bosnian Muslims. And we're sitting on the porch, and Women for Women International is run primarily by Bosnian Muslims. It's almost entirely Bosnian Muslims. mostly serves the Bosnian Muslim community. My translator was a Bosnian Muslim named Ayla. So I assumed she was a Bosnian Muslim, forgetting the giant pig in her Kiva photo. <laughs> so I just assumed she's a Bosnian Muslim. And, and, and so I, you know, speak, I ask some question that presumed uh, Islam. And uh, Ayla, my translator, turned to me, and without translating, she said, oh, Bob, she's not a Muslim. She is, she is a Croatian. She's Croatian Catholic. Oh, oh, well, let me rephrase. And we continued on. But the thing is, and this is some of the tragedy of the wars, it's really hard to even tell who's who. They kind of have to self-identify. And so then we went on with our day. And I'm sitting there marveling at the little bits of business that are starting to knit together the community. This is something that doesn't show up in research studies. It doesn't show up. How do you quantify this academically, that people can sit together and, and money brings people together like this? Another microfinance institution there in Bosnia uh, named, uh, named Partner, uh, I visited. They're not a, a, a Kiva partner, but one of their uh, executives told me, uh, and sometimes when your English is, is your second language, sometimes you have to speak simply enough that wisdom comes out, almost accidentally. Um, and she said, uh, uh, Bob, money has no religion. And I thought that was kind of a cynical thing to hear. But then as I'm sitting on the porch with Zorka, and they're doing business with each other regardless of religion, regardless of ethnic tension, oh, wow, that's, in that's incredibly useful. That's really good knowledge. Okay. So that's one of the little side effects. And this isn't something you'll learn on the Kiva website or in any of Kiva's literature or whatever. This is something you had to actually go and physically sit to see. Um, and there's a bunch of this sort of stuff. This is a, a, let's go to the Philippines. I'll take you around the world. We'll do a little travel log. This is a woman named Jennifer whose loan I financed uh, through uh, Negros Women for Tomorrow Foundation in the Philippines. And uh, Jennifer is on the island of Cebu, uh, which is a kind of a boomtown island. If you, if you make a phone call to, Geez, Cathay Pacific, I think. I'm not sure. Like a lot of airlines, their call centers are in Cebu with, with people on the phones. Um, but in, you, you get out of the main town, and you're just out in rural villages again. And Compostela is one of those rural villages. And this is what they call a sorry, sorry store. It's a convenience store that she runs out of her own home. Again, talk about work ethic. You know, there are images of the poor that we have so deeply ingrained in American society that poor people are lazy or they're unmotivated, or that poor people are, are uneducated or, or uninterested in educating themselves, or that poor people, uh, you know, whatever. And, and man, these, these stereotypes all explode the minute you go spend time with, you know, working poor people here and overseas. This woman works harder than probably anybody I ever met. And what I'm going to tell you, I still have trouble believing myself. I had to ask the translator three times to make sure I got this right. The story I got, and that everyone there was telling me, um, this woman, she lives next to a quarry. And so her business is primarily selling to the workers from the village who walk past her home on their way to work in the quarry. And so as they're going to go by and have their breakfast starting at dawn, so they're going to be wanting to eat around 5 in the morning, that means she's got to be up at 3 in the morning to start cooking hot meals, which she serves through that little window there. Um, and she'll have 10 or 12 meals. And when I was there, there were still you know, remnants of a lot of these meals sitting out. Uh, and she sells them a nice hot breakfast. Now, some of them come later, so breakfast is still being cooked and served, and then some guys are heading back and they need snacks. Somebody needs smoke, somebody whatever. So that convenience store keeps operating, um, and she gets a little rest in the afternoon, but she finally knocks off at about 10 o'clock at night. That's a 19-hour day. That's not even physically possible. And she gets a couple hours in the middle of the day. Her mom helps her out. Okay, I can kind of see it. I buy it. Um, and why do they do it? Because that little boy there. Um, uh, that, that, that little boy with, her, with his dad's head of hair. 
Um, that is the best hair on a little kid I think I've ever seen in my whole life. I, I love that kid. Um, and that's when I went and, uh, and visited him there. Um, and that Sorry Sorry store uh, is uh, successful enough, largely because of location. Uh, not every Sorry Sorry is nearly this successful. Um, it's a very common thing in the Philippines, very common business model. Um, the, uh, uh, that Sorry Sorry store is doing well enough that they were starting to hire other people in the community to act as delivery people. Uh, the business was expanding. It was actually creating other jobs. Again, something you don't see. You know, if, just even as a casual user of the Kiva website, you don't necessarily see that. It doesn't always show up in academic studies because in a whole village, how many jobs get created? Um, but this is a, a, a very successful example. Uh, here's a, a wonderful model. This is in, uh, in Kenya. This is a, a guy named Simon. Um, and by the way, it says, ended with loss, currency exchange loss. The, uh, the Kenyan shilling dropped during the course of the loan. I was out, I, I had $25 in this lo the guy's loan. I think I was down 14 cents or something like that. That's what that means. It was pretty trivial. Um, but Kiva billboards, you know. Uh, you lost 14 cents! Um, so Simon here purchased and insured a dairy cow. This is my favorite form of loan that I saw anywhere in the world. I love this. This works. <coughs> this company called Jehudi Kilimo in Kenya that um, is a for-profit organization. Not every Kiva partner is not for profit. Some of them are very profitable organizations. They, uh, what they do, um, and when I say very profitable, I mean sustainably profitable. I don't mean they're getting rich. Don't get me wrong. Um, Jehudi Kilimo uh, basically pioneered the cow loan. Uh, it's, you know how we buy a car and we pay it off? Suppose you're a cab driver and uh, your car is your primary business asset. And after you've paid it off in, I don't know, five years or however long your loan is, now you own the car free and clear and you can use it to make a profit. Now the native cows in eastern Kenya are desert cows. They're not, they don't really create a lot of milk. You can't have a dairy. But if you live in the highlands, uh, in, the, in the middle of Kenya, which is great dairy land, um, cows are rock and roll. They're fantastic. Uh, bring in a, a good western Guernsey and that cow, you can use the milk you can uh, produce so much milk that in the first year you pay that cow off and then you've got that cow free and clear creating income for as long as that cow lives. And they even fold a little bit of insurance into the loan. This produces wealth and they have a whole pattern set up. You get one cow, then after that cow your second purchase is what they call a zero grazing unit which is a means of sustaining and feeding and caring for the cow without needing a giant amount of pasture. Uh, and then you get the second cow and, and on and on. They've got this whole path set up that really works. I met a bunch of cow farmers in Kenya, and they talked about their cow, car, cows the way that, like, you know, like if I showed off a Ferrari, right, that's kind of like how they were showing off the cow. They were so into this. That cow's name, by the way, was Grace, I believe because she has none. Uh, that, 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 that this, 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 this photograph does not capture the amount of staggering and struggling that was required in order for, uh, uh, for Simon and uh, uh, Jen to... Uh, uh, you know, get that, get that particular photo. And that cow loan is really working. Now, this brings up other problems. Success means you have new and different problems. If everybody's producing dairy, well, crap, now we've got a lot of milk. What do we do about that? Now you've got to develop a better dairy supply chain. And sure enough, Jehudi Kilimo is working with that. And they're working with the Kenyan government to get that done. But that's a great sign. So this stuff is, frankly, honestly amazing. Um, and some of these uh, folks know what they're doing so well that this guy was so in 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 ingenious that I frankly, I was tempted, to, I joked when I was there that I'm going to ask him for a job, and it's looking like less of a joke sometimes. Uh, this particular Simon, this is also in Moringa, Kenya, same place, same loan, same, same company. He actually financed cows because he, he, he put together enough cows to get cash flow in order to finance his coffee business, which he just needed seed money for the coffee. This guy had a whole plan, and I've been in touch since, and it's working um, uh, kind of beautifully. Uh, so he's, he's uh, uh, got increasing amount of land. Anyway, I could bore you with all these different little details. The most important stuff, though, is that kind of like personal connection thing. I w and, and I want to share with you uh, something that I learned is my biggest takeaway from all of this stuff. Because the fact of the matter is technology is changing constantly. The way microfinance is being done is going to change constantly. People are constantly learning. Some loan products don't work that well. Some work fantastically well. Let's do more of those. Uh, the technology is, is advancing now in terms of mobile banking, that even the means by which it's done may be radically different in unpredictable ways in just a couple of years. So to get back to just human stuff that I, I really want to share with you, and that's ultimately the thrust of the book, when I went to Lebanon, um, 
I get a, I'm from a suburb in Ohio. People from suburbs in Ohio are usually just genetically not comfortable. Just, I grew up watching Tom Brokaw telling me that the Middle East was a scary place. You know, things blew up again today. And I was, okay. So I get a plane ticket. I fly into, into, into Beirut. I've got a hotel reservation. Okay. And I get to know the local MFI, and they're lovely and they're sweet. Lebanon, and it's not, you know, things are getting bad in Syria right now. I don't recommend visiting right off, but I had an amazing time there. People were so welcoming and cool, and come have a party, come sit with us. I have beer. And it, it, I, I loved it. And uh, one of the clients that I met was this guy, Hassan, uh, who has a, a little barber shop. And you know, I, I, when I went to college, uh, the idea of having, uh, being surrounded by Muslims in Lebanon, one of whom has a straight razor that he's going to put at your throat, was a terrifying thing. This was actually, a, this was wonderful. He gave me an amazing shave. We sat there, Euro music was playing. Um, it was totally different from any, any of my expectations of how it was. He was a wonderful guy. And uh, everybody I met, I I at least in West Beirut, um, I didn't get to see the whole city or whatever, Younger people particularly are so fed up with the sectarianism and everything, and they just really appreciated, uh, you know, that, that anybody who could see past all that, 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 that garbage, I, I, the welcome I got was constant. And I, this isn't intended to be a reading, but there's a thing that I wrote on one page of this book that is, I said it better in the book than I probably will ever come up with it in a, uh, 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 you know, off the top of my head. So I just want to share one page of the book because it's the most important thing I heard in all of the travels. And then we'll do a little Q&A. Um, and by the way, I understand there was a guy here uh, at some point in the past who was talking a bunch of stuff about how microfinance is bad and evil and doesn't work. And if there's questions that came out of that, I'm more than happy to address any of those. Very happy to. Um, but let me share with you the most important thing that I heard while I was, while I was traveling. Um, now, the people I was visiting was Al Majmua, was the microfinance institution. And they facilitated a bunch of visits uh, and let me just vouch for everybody they met as, I mean, they were cool and kind and creative. Um, it was actually the driver, a loan officer from Al Majmua that I met on, the, on, on one of the trips that said the five most important words that I heard in Lebanon. And I honestly am starting to think the five most important words I've heard in my whole life. Now, Ahmed didn't always work for Al Majmua. Um, he enjoys it there very much. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to speak with a slight accent here to indicate him. I can't do a Lebanese accent. I don't pretend to. I'm just trying to designate that it's him. Um, and the broken English is the best that I could transcribe in a bumpy car while uh, uh, the three tenors are singing on the radio while we're careening around the, the, the Beirut streets. But uh, to the best of my ability to share with you, Ahmed says, you know, he, he enjoys uh, Al Majmo. It's good. Everyone equal, like family, Christian, Muslim. Everyone love the same, you know? And the radio's got the three tenors and then REO Speedwagon, and the radio's cycling through, and we're having a nice conversation. And Ahmed goes on to tell more of his story. I ask God to bless my family. I am rich man, beautiful wife. He's got two young daughters. Uh, for 16 years, he had a large and very popular restaurant in Beirut. And like a lot of Beirutis, he stayed completely out of politics. I mean, like a lot of people everywhere. All he's trying to do is just make a really good living and just the politicians are going to do what they're going to do. And Ahmed's restaurant flourished, welcoming clients of all faiths. Shia, Sunni, all same. Television splits us. Politics. People love God, love each other, all same. He said this, I don't know how many times. But in July 2006, Hezbollah unilaterally launched rocket strikes against Israel they kidnapped Israeli soldiers near the border. And that touched off an escalating conflict that eventually led to Israeli airstrikes on Beirut itself. And in one of those strikes, Ahmed's restaurant was destroyed. Through no fault of his own, his entire livelihood was gone. So now, Ahmed works as a loan officer at Al Majmua, rebuilding his own life while helping others to do the same. And to help put his daughters through school, he also works on weekends, but now in someone else's restaurant. He, greets people, he seats people, he washes dishes, he, it's a huge step down. So I ask him if he's bitter. I would be. Somebody blows up my house, I'm ticked. You know, if going from being the owner of a restaurant to just being the hired help, is that made him angry at the Israelis? Or at Hezbollah? Or God? Or who, who, you know, how are you angry? No, no, no. As if he was talking to a child. Everything is clear for me. When my God is with me, I don't care about something like that, no. 
And he didn't pause here while he was speaking, but in my memory he did, because I've thought about these next five words, honestly, every single day ever since. The next five words that came out of his mouth were this. You love more, you win. You don't stop, thanks for God. And then again for emphasis, you love more, you win. Now, Ahmed didn't say that um, at some yoga retreat in, in Berkeley. You know, he didn't say that in, in, in some philosophy class or some abstract notion. It's not something he learned from a book, of any book. It's just who he was. It's what came out of his heart. And it was a choice he was making every single day in West Beirut after having his life blown up. And he could say it and mean it and struggle with it in the same moment and then resolve himself to do it again over and over and over again. You know, I don't think I have anything in the world I'll ever say as important as what Ahmed said to me that day. And so now I'll just try to share that with you a little bit and hope you, you walk out of here, you know, carrying that with you. Um, so that's pretty much the, 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 the shindig about the book. Um, and this was spray painted on the wall in West Beirut. Uh, this is, this is a, one of the graffitos, uh, graffiti uh, right there in Beirut. Some, somebody had put that up. And so that's what I'm sure motivated, uh, uh, you know, Matt, uh, when he founded Kiva, to be so passionate about creating it. I know that's where Kiva lenders come from when they are you know, trying to reach around the world that way. That's why the clients are doing it, is for their kids. Um, and the, even the people who are, who are, you know, critics of microfinance, they're doing it out of concern for the clients too. It's all coming from a place of love. And that's a really wonderful thing to hang on to. So anyway, that's pretty much my spiel. Oh, and by the way, my own loans, you can look them up. Um, it's online. You can poke around the Kiva website and you can find my own loans. This is as of February. Um, my original 20 grand, which was the amount of money that I'd put in, in February, it had recycled around almost seven times, and it had worked out to get repaid to me personally over 99% of the time. Kiva wide, it's 99%. So it's pretty much as reliable as a savings account. I mean, if I, how much money do you get on a savings account right now? Like nothing, right? You put it into a savings account, you get like a fraction of 1%. So if I put 25 bucks into, you know, Bank of America, and then t a year later come back, I've got 25 bucks and a couple of pennies. Or I can put it in Kiva, and a year later, on average, I've got 25 bucks minus a couple of pennies. And for that price, this little stack of pennies, that big, that money gets to be off in you know, Nicaragua helping some bicycle delivery guy or something. That's a pretty good deal. I'll go with that. So that's part of why, uh, why I like this stuff. So anyway, that's the spiel. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks, for, for, thanks for coming to work today. And uh, set this up for the cameras. And if you guys have uh, questions or answers, if you have answers, please bring them. Um, uh, you know, I'm more than happy there's a microphone or you can just stand up and squeal, whatever. I'm happy to, to answer anything. All right, we have our first contestant. Well, you know, there, there are situations where charity is a much better option, but it's, it depends on situations. I think for anybody, look, uh, I think when microfinance went through its big vogue around the time of the Nobel Peace Prize to Grameen and to Muhammad Yunus, and you know, people were talking in such grand terms about how microfinance is going to end poverty and all that, that actually only makes logical sense if the sole cause of poverty was a lack of financing in a lot of these places. And if you've got an earthquake in Haiti, you, you need to bring in aid. I mean, aid is like the first and best option in a lot of cases. But if, you just, if aid alone was the thing that was going to change the world. How much aid has been poured into Africa without you know, careful planning, without careful oversight? Look, if you, if you bring a bunch of rice in, that's great. But what about the rice farmers who are already there? And all of a sudden, you may have driven them out of business. Ec economic dislocation can be caused by aid as much as it can be relieved by it. So what has to be done is, is what's most important, more than anything, is actually the ability to listen to the local people and say, what do you need? And, and we as Westerners very often kind of have this, uh, you know, we're the ones who will figure out and solve the problems. When a lot of times the folks on the ground, they know exactly what they need and you just ask. One of the things that I found most appealing about Kiva is that Kiva is people saying, okay, this is what I want on my farm. I want a cow. It's not some guy from the World Bank or from, you know, some big whoever, some foundation coming in and saying, you know what you need? It's a giant hydroelectric dam. You know, it's, it's a guy saying, hey, I want a cow. This is going to fix things for me in my time frame and, and with my work. And that sort of bottom-up approach, I think, is uh, at minimum equally as important, and I think probably much more important than, uh, uh, you know, simply throwing aid at a circumstance. In my book, I even get into circumstances that are, you know, really quite famous, uh, where people, you know, 
put their money into a charity thinking, hey, this is going to be great, and it didn't work out the way that, that we'd hope. Um, uh, you remember uh, uh, Live Aid and USA for Africa in the 1980s, which did wonderful stuff. And to their everlasting credit, it was, that was the first global event where you really had people all over the world, anyone with a television, aware of the ability to reach out and reach around the world. That's an amazing cultural impact, regardless of what happened after that. And they did save a very large number of lives. But the dictatorship in Ethiopia that was largely responsible for the problem, it wasn't a weather thing, it wasn't just drought, there was a horrifying dictatorship in Ethiopia that was doing um, uh, uh, collectivizing the farms, which we know what they did in China and Russia, which was busy uh, uh, you know, as essentially trying to put down rebellions all over the country. They were the ones who wound up being in charge of where a lot of the aid went. And in, while it saved some lives, a lot of lives, and there's different e estimates, there's also estimates, and even at the time while it was happening, that it was also uh, you know, leading to, to, to helping empower that central government. So I don't think it's ever going to be fair for anyone to just say, well, aid is the answer, or microfinance is the answer. There's, there's never one answer. Um, and I, I think it just needs to be taken on a really sophisticated level, you know, listening closely, experts from this part of the world need to be listening to the experts there. That's my feedback. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, three positives about Kiva. Um, well, one, I mean, I, for me, they're never, the, the people in the pictures are never just going to be people in, in the pictures anymore. I mean, I'm in an, an exceptional situation in that, I mean, any time I lend to somebody in Cebu in the Philippines, I, I remember the place now, and if I don't, know that specific person, I know what a, lop, what, what, what a sorry sorry is, you know. Um, so there's that thing. And, and it has a, uh, uh, there's a huge educational component too that I think is, is, is wonderful. People, uh, schools are starting to, to, to use Kiva uh, in, 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 in classrooms. You know, a kid gets involved with it and, and I don't know, I, I heard a story about a, um, a classroom where uh, I think it was some village in Nicaragua that makes really great hammocks. And the kids in the class were like, really? And they got really fascinated with the hammock making. And they, got, as a result, just from an extension of that, got more interested in Nicaragua and then Central America. And it you know, builds from that. You find one point of interest. So I think that's a really wonderful thing. Another wonderful thing, there's these things called lending teams they have at Kiva, which are affinity groups, self-selected. Uh, you have the, uh, the two biggest ones are the Kiva Christians and the Kiva Atheists, who are essentially having an ideological argument over whether or not you need a deity to foment generosity. Um, and so far, at least on a statistical level, the atheists are winning rather strongly. Um, and so the Christians get right back in there. And you know, if you're going to have a theological debate, this is one of the best ways to do it. it it's a fight over generosity. It's kind of wonderful. Um, and those lending teams can be really powerful. I didn't know how much. There's a team on Kiva right now that I, I can't take really any credit for called Friends of Bob Harris. It's uh, 1,100, 1,200 people, I don't know the exact number, who, I don't know how this happened. Um, they, they're the fourth biggest team on Kiva. They passed Kiev, Europe, uh, Team Europe. They passed Team Australia. We passed the gays. We passed, like, so far there's the Christians, the atheists, and uh, uh, there's one other team. And then friends of Bob Harris. And I'm just this dude. I mean, that doesn't even make sense. And what it is, is it's just a very fun team that kind of gathered momentum. It's just, it's, it's a, uh, there's discussion board aspect to it. And people get on and they're playing with everything and, and, and uh, it, it, there's a spirit there. These are just funny, charming people who found each other. And I'm just sort of, I, I have very little to do with it. I mean, you know, like if there's a big thing of cotton candy, sugar's just swirling around and somebody puts a stick down in there and you come out with cotton candy, I'm the stick. But I'm not that, I'm not that candy. And, uh, so these people have the, the you, you, you go on the Friends of Bob Harris team and they just decided to have a summer road trip. And so they went through all these loans on Kiva finding people who sold stuff that you'd want to buy along the side of the road or people who sold tires or people who sold anything related to a summer road trip. And that was how they fundraised. I had nothing to do with that, but on it went. And that team's raised $3.4 million in lending funds. Um, and I'm honored. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know what I am about it. It's cool. Um, so those are three aspects I would think of, the educational aspect, the, uh, the, the sense of connection, and the, uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, the social aspect. A uh, bad thing about Kiva. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's a few things that I'd like to see done differently, to be honest. Um, 
I, you know, the, the one thing that, that some people point out is that you can't see the interest rate for the specific loan that you're, you're investing in. Um, that, would be, that would be nice. I'd like, I can see how long it lasts. I can see that it's six months. I can see that it's... But I also understand that to just put that number in a vacuum, well, what's the local interest rate comparatively to what banks avail? And then you've got to put that information. And what's the local inflation rate? Okay, that information has to be there. And if you're going to have full transparency, then you've got to get into transparency of context. And that starts becoming a really complex task. So, you know, but that's a, that's, that's, that's a discussion I think that's worth having. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a couple other things. There are kinds of loans that I, I sometimes see that um, uh, uh, I think need a little bit better labeling. They have, for example, if you make a loan into, into India, that's a th it's, your money's not coming back for three years, even if it's a six-month loan. Now, they billboard that. They put that up there. That's really obvious. Some of the educational loans that can be up to 11 years, uh, you know, there's a university in South Africa. I've seen a number of cases where people made the loan, clicked lend $25, and didn't realize they weren't going to see that money back for 11 years. That's a tiny complaint, really. That's easy to fix. They can go and fix that and billboard that harder by this afternoon. So I would say that most of my, my quibbles with Kiva are more along the lines of quibbles about information being made, you know, maybe a little bit more visible or usable. Um, that's my best answer. Um, well, it, I should correct, the, the question, if everybody could hear it, was uh, any of the challenges that the clients had before they, they came to Kiva. Well, they actually didn't come to Kiva. They go to their local micro microfinance or, uh, uh, institution. And when they walk in the door, they may not have any idea that Kiva even exists. I mean, they don't know who's funding that institution. Um, they're just trying to get a loan to buy a cow. And so when they walk in, um, uh, uh, then the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the nice man, they do the loan thing, they say, oh, by the way, your loan's going to be funded with Kiva. We need you to pose for a picture. And they do a little bit of, you know, that stuff. But for the clients themselves, most of their experience is primarily just with the local micro lender. Uh, that said, on the rare occasions when I did talk to clients who were aware of Kiva or, or knew that there was some, you know, crowdfunding aspect to their loans, they loved that. They just think that's like, you know, the idea, I met a guy in Nicaragua again who, when he realized that there were people from like 20 countries who'd invested in his business, that's just like, my God, that must feel cool. Um, as far as the challenges they have beforehand, you know, almost everybody that I met had you know, you got to scramble to make a living at, here in the West. I mean, everybody in here has got college educations and we're all scrambling and figuring out, God, what the hell am I going to do when I'm going to change my career in three years or I just came from something else. And if you're living at the $6 a day level, just multiply that by a, a huge factor. Everybody I think I met had been in five different businesses prior to the one they were doing. And maybe this one's working now, so they're sticking with it. There were some, and I mentioned this in the book, there were some where the business didn't quite work out and then they try something else. Um, there was a, a kind of a humorous one in the book where uh, um, I met this, this, this woman who I call Mercy in the book because I don't, don't want to uh, embarrass anyone, who made uh, charcoal flavored yogurt, and, uh, which is the local flavor. They, you know, it's, it's Western Kenya. It's the bark of a tree and it's the flavor. And it tastes really like charcoal flavored yogurt. And it's, I had the intestinal equivalent of an international incident. Um, after consuming this charcoal yogurt. I think the next morning they could hear me in Uganda. And uh, her business, strangely enough, she didn't sell enough of the charcoal flavored yogurt to really stay in business. Now she's okay, her husband's a cop, and they're, they're fine. They're economically fine. But I followed up afterwards meeting clients. Are, is this person still in business? Is this person still in business? And so on to see. The majority were. Nobody was getting huge rich. Some people were pretty successful. A lot of people were skating, and there were a couple that didn't work out. Um, and just like everywhere else in the world, really, um, if that makes any sense. All right, so let's hit the Lend button. It's pretty easy to find, the big, giant, green Lend button. Oh, wait, I, I don't know how much I have to Lend. Do I have any, anything in the kitty? I didn't see it. Let's see. Uh, okay, all right, that's enough for five loans. If I don't tip Kiva, I'll, I'll, tip, I'll tip Kiva. Okay, so, all right, let's make five loans. Where do we want a loan? Um, here's a list of countries. Is there anybody I haven't? I haven't went to Thailand yet. I keep looking to see if Thailand comes up. Somebody shout out a country. We'll make a loan there. Yeah. What was that? Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, and I heard another one? Yeah. Vietnam. Vietnam and Zimbabwe. All right. Uh, we'll click for Zimbabwe, and we'll click for Vietnam. And we'll 
close that. And here's Zimbabwe and Vietnam. There's 33 loans available. And uh, okay, here's a woman who's uh, uh, going to buy a greater variety and quantity of pork pies and salted shredded meat to satisfy her. Looks like she's, she's, she's upgrading her stock in an existing established business. This looks like somebody who knows what the heck she's doing. I mean, I'm buying that as a business model. Um, and by the way, I don't, I don't just throw the money around. I want to make sure that they're, they're doing stuff. Um, okay, these people were going to buy winter clothes. That's not really a business model. So, you know, I don't necessarily feel like I'm investing in, in, in but at the same time, they're trying not to freeze in the winter. So, okay, this is first Zimbabwe loan. I'm, I'm feeling compassion, not necessarily a business investment, but I'm okay with that if I think about it. I'm okay with that. Oh, loan already funded. Uh, interesting. All right. Okay, this woman's definitely all up into the business thing. Let's see who else we got here. Uh, new shampoo chair to better satisfy her customers. Apparently the one she has is pointy. So uh, apparently she wants a soft chair or something. That's a, that's a functional business. All right. Um, she's just reselling clothes. You, you get a lot of those businesses. I, I haven't seen anybody like really flourishing or getting rich, but a lot of times, a lot of loans get, wind up getting used in what's called income smoothing, which I don't have a problem with. Sometimes people have problems with it. Um, well, that's not really flourishing as a business. Income smoothing is where you just use a loan to do exactly like what it sounds like. You smooth your income and maybe your, your income is seasonal and you, you know, anybody who's had credit cards and had to juggle them knows what income smoothing is or had to figure out, ah, oh, geez, this month sucked. Oh, I thought it was going to be so much better. Well, I'll be better next month and you smooth. Um, uh, and there's a whole, there's a lot of people who criticize micro lending because it's, well, it's just, in, some people are just income smoothing. Yes, they are. I'm fine with it. Um, Okay, we'll hit her and let's see, is there another Zimbabwe one? Um, okay, she makes bedspreads and curtains and seat covers, I'm in. All right, there's a bunch of loans. Okay, hit my basket. And we're going to tip Kiva. 15 bucks in the kitty for Kiva. Continue. Complete order. There, I just made four loans that went to, one to Asia, one to Southern Africa. Now, in full disclosure, those loans um, were already had been made to the clients, or they're what they call predispersed. Clients already have the money. It's the only way this, the thing could work. Um, let's say, for example, that uh, uh, no, nobody's sitting around waiting for me. When is Bob going to send that $25 to Zimbabwe? I can't buy blankets till Bob sends $25. Uh, the way it works is that the, the micro lender actually gives the money first, then it gets refilled by us on the back end. And then from that point on, it repays just like the conventional bucket brigade. That's the only way the model would work. Um, if it was tried any other way, it just it, it wouldn't be feasible. Um, and, 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 and I like it that way. Uh, one of the first loans I saw on Kiva was for a guy named Victor in Paraguay, who was in the middle of a dengue fever epidemic. A dengue fever is a nasty tropical disease. I've had it myself. It's not fun. Um, and it kills kids. And uh, it's mosquito-borne, and Victor wanted to buy a bunch of strips of leather and some citronella. Dip the leather in the citronella, make anti-mosquito bracelets for the kids, sell them cheaply, and kids don't die, right? I want his loan funded as fast as possible. I don't want him waiting around for me. Does that make sense? So th that, that makes perfect sense. Um, so that was, how long did that take? That was two minutes, three minutes? Once you have an account, it's, not a, it's, not, not, it's very, very easy. Uh, I want to make really clear, I don't totally speak for Kiva in my response. I think I have an accurate response here. We have Bennett from Kiva's here, so if I get something wrong, you correct me, all right? Just jump right in. Um, those go to operating expenses, you know, overhead, you know, stuff like that, to my understanding of it. Um, and Kiva's annual report is right on the website. Um, they're totally transparent about, you know, where the money comes from and where it goes. Uh, and I don't remember exactly what percentage of their operating expenses come from that 15% that uh, donation along with a loan. What is it? 65% 65 of the operating expenses come from the tips. So without people doing those tips, Kiva goes belly up. Or Kiva at least has to shrink dramatically. So if I like Kiva, I should probably contribute occasionally to the operating expenses. Now, in all honesty to you, I don't always do it when I make loans. Sometimes I'm just not feeling that generous. You know, I have my days where I'm just kind of like, yeah, you know, eh. But, um, and if you've been to the Kiva office, um, it's not extravagant in any way. And actually the salaries of the, I'm not going to disclose anything here, but it's publicly disclosed, the salaries of all of the senior staff are in the annual reports. Ain't nobody getting rich. Um, if, if I were to, like after the presentation's over, you know, I can tell you what you can find. I've mentioned it to a few people and they go, how does anyone live in San Francisco on that? And that's the senior 
people. Um, by the way, Bennett, how does anyone live in San Francisco on that? I mean, it's really not a ton. So I don't see anybody, you know, making bank. I, th I, I think the money gets used pretty well. I think that's actually a very, very general question. It's a little hard to answer because of how general it is. I think it would be much easier to measure, okay, how do we measure the impact of the cow loans in, in Kenya? I could answer that question because there's going to be specific statistics about a specific program. How do we measure, and then we could go into lots of details. Um, and then to measure the impact of Kiva, then we would have to, on aggregate, have all of that data. I don't have it. Um, so to a certain extent, for me, you know, you could argue that there's a certain act of faith thing going on. But in my case, I've actually been in the field to a bunch of these places, and I've seen them working. I've only been to a couple of places that weren't, and they weren't Kiva partners. So uh, things look good to me. Um, I think that the other way to, one, one of the measures of it too is that if it wasn't working, and, and this is also true of microfinance in general, when people talk about microfinance as being something that is, is, you know, hurts the poor or that has, you know, the real negative stuff that's said, almost always, I mean, I, I don't think I can think of a case, it's made as a grand statement addressing not just a specific situation, but then it's overgeneralized to the whole field. Andhra Pradesh, India, horrific tragedy caused by microfinance institutions who were much more concerned about profit than they were the welfare of the client. Extremely clear, extremely horrible. And the fact that nobody's in prison over that is an outrage. Um, but does that have anything to do with Jehudi Kilimo in Kenya? No. Just nothing. And does that have anything to do with Kiva? No. But, and some of the problem from, uh, some of this actually is the problem of the microfinance industry itself has done this to itself by using such inaccurate terminology. I would like to see the word microfinance abolished from the English language because it's such a broad term. I don't know of any other field of human endeavor where one word is used to blanket describe so many diverse activities. It's a word like sports. If I say sports, am I talking about baseball, football, hockey, whatever? Now those endeavors, let's say, I'm gonna rant here for a second, but think about it. Baseball, football, hockey, they're basketball. They're four completely different endeavors, but they're all done for profit. They're all done with a certain demographic of people for a certain demographic of people with a certain set of advertisers. They're the same exact business model and it's the same exact people just behaving slightly differently. And yet we have very precise words for those and we would never confuse something that happened in hockey with something that happened in basketball. Now let's look at microfinance. You have international IPO things like SKS that are massive and you have little places on the corner in Nepal that are actually funded out of somebody's back pocket. You have people who are for profit, you have people who are not for profit. You have people who are offering education and, 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 and health care and health training and, and AIDS awareness and all sorts of different personal things. And you have loan mills that exist simply to try to make loans. You have a massively diverse set of activities that have nothing in common with each other at all except the stated goal of ultimately helping an end user who is economically micro by local comparison. That's nuts! But if we use that terminology, inevitably when something goes wrong in one part of it, and it's microfinance, everybody catches the flack. And that's part of the reason that uh, you know, any misbehavior at any part of the field is, gets so generalized. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but. I hope by addressing that just slightly, that will help us think more critically when people start saying, and microfinance does this bad thing. Really, which part? Which specific part where? And then that becomes a very important next question to ask. Is that, is that, did, did that clear anything up? Yay, good. Oh.